morning. Uh, my name is Ernest Jahangir. I'm a colorectal uh, surgeon uh, working in the UK. And uh, today I want to talk to you about stenting, especially for colorectal cancer, in case of uh, colorectal cancer causing obstruction. Now I live in a very beautiful part of the country, lots of lakes, lots of beautiful landscape, but the problem with that is there's a very high incidence of bowel cancer in this area. It's a largely a rural population. The diet is very poor. There's low fiber, very high in fats, and uh, un especially saturated fats. A lot of people smoke, and there's a possibly a genetic predisposition to bowel cancer. Because of the rural uh, nature of the population, a lot of these patients present very late, and 55% um, present in Duke's stage C and D, which also brings up the number of patients who actually present where we can only give them palliative treatment rather than curative. Now, that led to a high number of defunctioning stomas, and in uh, 2002, we looked at the number of de uh, defuncting stomas that we we're doing for palliative treatment, and thought there should be a better way of treating these patients. So we looked at uh, whether we could start stenting these patients as uh, colonic stents had come into place then. So the initial experience that we had in 2002 and three we used what we call as a beside-the-scope stent. Now, this is a stent which is quite cumbersome, it was difficult to deploy, and it could only be used for rectal or distal sigmoid tumors. First, you pass the scope up, and you pass a guide wire through the scope, and then you have to take the scope out, and then insert the stent over the guide wire while the scope is reinserted on the side. I mean, possibly the best way to describe doing this is trying to drive looking at your rear view mirror, or actually, teaching your teenage daughter how to drive, that's about the same way. You needed somebody else to take hold of the scope or take hold of the, of the stent, and that made it very difficult to do, which led to roughly around about a 50% failure rate. So that's not a very good uh, way of doing things. And this is a picture of the beside the scope stent. Actually, I should have uh, put something by the side of this picture to show you how big this is. This is almost as big as a gastroscope. So you can imagine the poor patient has a colonoscope in the, you know, in the anus, along with the stent in the anus, and it's very uncomfortable, not very good at all. Luckily, round about in 2003, they started making stents for the colon. These were the same stents that were used in upper GI surgery, and they modified it and used them for colons. And they call them TTS stents, which is through the scope stents. Now the system fitted down the colonoscope. The guide wire and stent were passed over the, uh, and the stent was passed over the guide wire all through the scope. You know, it's pretty much similar to the Seldinger technique. You insert under direct vision and X-ray control. And uh, because we had some experience in stenting of other areas like stenting of the ureters, we took to this sort of stenting quite easily. Now this is, what a stent looks like when it's uh, fully deployed. And this is the, the system which deploys the stent. You can see the tube uh, which the stent comes in. The guide wire goes into this uh, uh, green, the guide wire is in that tube and it comes through and you pass the stent over the guide wire and the deploying mechanism opens up the stent. Now there are different types of stents. There's the through the scope self-expanding stents, which are usually made of nitrinol and titanium. You can also get absorbable stents made out of PDS, which lasts for about six weeks. It's quite expensive, and in my opinion, a total waste of time, because after six weeks, tensile strength is gone, and you've lost the whole idea of putting a stent in. Uh, covered stents are usually used in upper GI surgery when colorectal surgery tend to use uh, through the scope uncovered stents. These are usually of the diameter of 2.4 centimeters and a length of between 6 to 12 centimeters. Now the indications of inserting a stent is usually acute large bowel intestinal obstruction and this can be done for bridging towards surgery or palliative reasons. 
Now, you can also do it for subacute large bowel obstructions, especially when it is for palliation, when you know that the patient will go into a full-blown obstruction soon. And secondly, before radiotherapy to downstage rectal tumors. Full now, bridging towards surgery, some studies say that one in four patients with colorectal cancer present with acute intestinal obstruction. I think this is rather a high figure, but it's close to at least one in six. Now, when you operate on patients with acute intestinal obstruction, the mortality is high. It ranges between 10 to 30 percent, and there's a very high morbidity. There's also a very high 30-day mortality for these patients. Now, if you're able to put a stent in, you avoid doing the operation in the acute setting. And you allow stabilization, optimizing the patient before the operation, and that really brings down the mortality and morbidity for these patients. And there's also one more uh, objective. You can convert an open operation to a laparoscopic approach because uh, in the acute setting with acute intestinal obstruction with dilated bowel, it's virtually impossible to do a laparoscopic operation. Now, palliative treatment, acute obstruction, it allows the relief of obstruction without a stoma and without an operation. It gives very good palliation. It also reduces bleeding from the tumor, which is another side, a good side effect from uh, putting in a stent. Now, stents can be only placed in certain positions in the colon. You really can't place it in the rectum anywhere below seven centimeters because uh, the stent will stick out of the anus when the patient bears down. That's not a very good feeling. Uh, it's also very difficult to insert a stent uh, beyond the hepatic flexure because the number of bends that you have to encounter to put the colonoscope up makes the deployment of the stent virtually impossible. Now, the method, the equipment that we use. You obviously need a colonoscope with at least a minimum of 3.7 millimeter channel, a flexible long guide wire, which is about four meters, it's the same guide wire we use in the ERCPs. Use a flush cannula sometimes. Use a stent. I use stents from three companies, Cook, which is a UK company, Microtech, which is a um, Korean company, and Shangzhou, which is a Chinese company. Uh, the main reason why I use three companies is because one is 1,000 euros, next is 700 euros, and the third one is 500 euros. So depending, if it's an easy to put stent, I'll use the cheapest possible one. If it's a difficult position, I'll use the most expensive one. You need an image intensifier. You need an extra assistant uh, to do this because the guide wire is so long, you practically have one assistant standing about three meters away from you holding the guide wire and the stent. I should have taken a picture of that. It's actually quite funny to see three people strung out with a scope, follow the guide wire, and the stent all in a row. Uh, a radiologist is not essential. Sometimes we need a super stiff guide wire, and uh, you need contrast sometimes. Now, the technique used is you measure the length of the tumor on the CT scan. Choose a stent at least four centimeters longer than the tumor. You need two centimeters of stent above the tumor, two centimeters of stent below the tumor. You pass the scope up to the tumor, avoiding all loops if possible. Then you pass the flexible guide wire through the tumor. Now, this is sometimes difficult because you look at uh, this picture, sometimes you can't find the lumen easily. So you need to find the lumen and pass the guide wire through it. And to confirm the position, what you can do is introduce a little contrast through the flush cannula, and you can see the contrast there. And you can see the guide wires now follow the contrast into the lumen of the bow. If the guide wire passes easily and conforms to the direction of the proximal colon, you pass the stent over the guide wire. If there's a doubt, put a flush cannula in and inject some contrast. Try and use undiluted contrast because uh, it's quite difficult to see on the image intensifier if you use diluted. Now you confirm that the guide wire is in the proximal bowel when the mucosal folds are seen with contrast. If needed, you can exchange for a super stiff guide wire if you find there are too many bends when you're going up. 
Uh, this is the image intensifier view of the, that's the stent going through. And if you look carefully, you can find one of the markers of the stent there, which is a little darker marker on the stent, and the other one is somewhere here. Now this is what the endoscopic picture looks like when you pass the stent through, and you can actually see through the plastic, and you can see the, the stent through the plastic there. Now this is a schematic diagram of uh, what you've got to ensure that the two, the two markers, one is proximal and one is distal to the uh, tumor. In real life, you, you, you can't really see this, and the way that we mark the tumor is to put an ordinary paper clip paste it on the patient with a little bit of uh, sticky tape and mark it when you put past the scope up to it. But this is another picture showing the stent, oops, press the wrong button, stent which is passing through the tumor and ready to be deployed. You can see there's the marker there. With the deployment, what you do is you start deploying and you check on the image intensifier to see that it is opening. And once it is, once it is opening, you open it fully, making sure that the distal end is distal to the end of the tumor. Once that is done, for confirmation, you pass the scope up through the stent as far as it can go. Remember, do not force. It can damage the scope quite easily. How do I know that? I've done it. Damaged is one of the scopes. Now, this is what I call the poo sign. Once you've got the stent in the right position and it's beginning to work, a gush of feces comes out confirming the correct positioning of the stent. Now, this is what the stent looks like when you've opened it. And that's the guide wire with the tube, the deployment tube here. And that's a stent sitting distal to the tumor. Once you've done that, you take an x-ray picture confirming the position on the image intensifier. The stent looks almost like an hourglass with a narrow waist and dilated on both sides. This is how it looks when you initially put in the stent. And this is another picture of that. You can see it, oops, I'm sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. You can see uh, the stent there, the narrow part, I'll show you with the pointer here. That's the narrow part, that's the dilated part proximal, and that's the dilated part distal. If you take an x-ray picture 24 hours later, you'll find that that hourglass picture has gone, and if you see at the bottom there, the middle part has opened up, and that's what we call as the self-expanding stent, which opens over 24 hours after insertion of the stent, keeping the tumor open. Now this is a CT scan picture of the stent. If you see the stent, I'll follow the pictures down. There is a stent. If you just follow that picture, as I run the series down, you'll see how the stent keeps the tumor open. And this particular patient, I've actually put in two stents because the patient had tumor overgrowth. And uh, I put in a second stent about 12 months after I put in the initial stent. Now, the experience that we've had in our hospitals over the last 12 years, we started in 2003. We haven't used the radiologists at all because we didn't think they were essential. Other series all involve a radiologist. And uh, with the, our experience, we don't think that it is essential. We used two colorectal surgeons, I mean, basic two of us who did these uh, stents, and a total of 80 patients up to um, I think it's up to March this year. We have had 80 patients. The male-female ratio is 49 is to 31. Age range from 48 years, which is the youngest, up to 90 years. But the median is around about 72, 74. The indications for stenting for palliation, 65 patients were for palliation, and 15 for bridging towards surgery, bringing a total of 80. Now, the position in the colon, you will notice most of the patients are to the left side, to the distal side beyond the splenic flexure, with five in the transverse colon and two at the hepatic flexure. I haven't tried any stenting in the ascending colon because uh, it's very difficult for the stent to deploy in that area. Most of these patients were at the initial presentation of uh, the tumor, though eight of them out of the 80, that's 10%, were 
were for recurrent disease. And the results in 80 patients, out of the 80, 77, we were able to insert a stent successfully. Obviously, three were unsuccessful, so those three went straight for operation. And out of the 77, 74 had a good clinical result, but three of them had various early complications. One of them, stent migrated. It moved quite soon after insertion of the stent, and by the next day, the stent had uh, passed out. Uh, one patient had persistent obstruction, and we feel that possibly the proximal end was not fully across the tumor, so uh, the patient went in for an operation as well. And one patient had pr uh, perforation of the bowel proximal to the stent. This is probably because we caught the obstruction a little bit too late, and the patient already had impending obstruction by the time we stented the patient. And the patient had a perf perforation in the cecum, so uh, we had to do an operation for that patient as well. Now, delayed complications. Uh, we had eight delayed complications. Five of them was due to tumor overgrowth. And this tumor can grow into the stent and actually cause a blockage again. Uh, two of them were passed by the patient, and one was removed as it extruded out of the anus. And out of these pa eight patients, we re-stented three of them. Two of them went into uh, to have a defunctioning stoma. And one patient I managed to dilate with a balloon dilator. And one patient was helped by using an APC laser to the overgrowth of the tumor. And one patient died of disseminated malignancy where we didn't have to do, we couldn't do much uh, for the patient with regard to the stent. Now, bridging towards surgery, a total of 15 cases were done, out of which five were in the upper rectum, seven in the sigmoid uh, stroke descending colon, and three in the transverse colon. On the average, we had 22 days to optimize and bring the patient into a much better nutritional status and much better, um, uh, you know, get them really fit for surgery so that uh, we were able to do laparoscopic surgery for 12 of them. And in this age group, there was no mortality in, uh, uh, no perioperative peri mortality in this, uh, in, in this uh, group where we bridged to surgery. Now, the ultimate destination of the 80 stents, 62 of them, the patient died with a stent in situ, showing that this was very good palliation for them. 15 of them were removed at surgery because they were used for bridging for surgery. Two of them were passed by the patient. And one, uh, we had to remove the one that uh, was sticking out of the anus. So in conclusion, colonic stents in acute obstruction, secondary to bowel cancer, is successful in 92% of patients. It is safe. There was 0% mortality and 0% stent perforation. It is appropriate. It is done without radiologist support if the endoscopist is adequately experienced. Bridging to surgery reduces mortality and converts 80% of them to a laparoscopic approach. And I feel that this is a must for any oncological surgeon dealing with intestinal obstruction. And these are um, the nice guidelines which follow up what I had said in the previous slide, that uh, it is good for palliation, avoid stoma, you do it for bridging for surgery. But one thing that uh, the um, NICE guidelines bring out is that it should be done within 24 hours of admission, which uh, in that particular case that we had the proximal perforation, if we had done this uh, stenting within 24 hours of admission, we probably would have avoided that proximal perforation. It converts an emergency operation to an elective operation, reduces mortality and morbidity, and converts an open operation to a laparoscopic approach. You do need expertise, but the expertise is easily taught. It is our, any an, uh, experienced endoscopist should be able to do it quite easily. I'll leave you with another nice picture of the place where I live. This is a nice hillside, which is entirely covered with bluebells. And in the second week of May, it looks purple. Thank you. Any questions from the floor? Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
Uh, the only contraindication is the position of the stent, uh, the tumor. If the tumor is in the lower rectum or mid rectum, we cannot stent it. If it's beyond the hepatic flexure, it's very difficult. And uh, these are the only two indications, but otherwise, I would try a stent first. Uh, we also perform stenting in, uh, for palliative reasons on our institution, and we found that uh, long, complex, and angulated uh, strictures were difficult to stent. Uh, so how about your exp experience in, this, in these patients? The one position we found very difficult was the splenic flexure. Uh, that's because of the particular bends that we do. But uh, using the, the stents from the various companies, we found that the stent from Cook, which has a new delivery system, uh, it solved a lot of those pro problems of uh, getting uh, the stent to deploy around corners. So the length isn't then... Uh, the length is not a problem because you can always use two stent, stents. Tandem standing, okay. Uh, how about the angulated uh, strictures? Angulated strictures, as long as you can get the floppy guide wire around it, so you, what you can do to uh, open the angulation is put a flush cannula in, swap it for a super stiff guide wire, and that way you can get rid of some of the angulation. Okay, okay. And I saw that you use uh, um, endoscope with a 3.7 millimeter. Yes. Um, I found that uh, this would be too, too small working channel for through the scope uh, application of the, uh, the stent. Uh, so we used uh, Olympus uh, endoscope with a 6 millimeter uh, working channel. I would love to have one. It, I, I do find it uh, sometimes difficult with a 3.7, but we don't have a, a, a scope, uh, one of the therapeutic scope with a six millimeter channel. So I've used the 3.7 and it's worked with all three companies of stents. Okay, thank you very much. Any other question? Oh, yes. Shrink the tumor, especially for. It's called the recording. Oh. It now speak to the microphone. Oh, all right. Has there been any thought to impregnating the stent with uh, chemo or radiation therapy uh, to sh to shrink the tumor, especially before surgery? No, uh, the uh, there has been no uh, topical chemotherapy agent that we can use. And radiotherapy, it, the stent is actually a very good guide for the radiotherapist because uh, you can see it on uh, the staging CT scans, and it's easy for them to direct uh, radiotherapy towards it. And no, we have not used uh, brachytherapy, and nobody's thought of using brachy radiotherapy to directly insert radiotherapy to the tumor. Okay, thank you. Any other question? I just ask you one question. You are a good in this quest, and your team, I think, are very experienced. It was, there is no any patient with perforation I see here. In That's right. But in the, when we review your literature on something, you find uh, some cases or high incidence of perforation when you do stenting for the tumor? I think a lot of those studies were from the previous generation of stents. With through the scope stents, the, the, most of the studies say the perforation rate is less than 10%. 10%. Most of them are less than 10%, and that is acceptable in an in acute uh, patient with intestinal obstruction. There's a good proportion of them will have perforations. So if you can avoid that operation by, with a percentage of less than 10%, it's a pretty good odds. Yep. Okay, any question? Okay, many thanks for okay. the good.